Go in the front. Can I jump back to the magnesium? Is there any natural <coughs> way of getting magnesium shot other than taking the pill? Is there a natural way of getting in a food? In a food? Mm -hmm. The things that contain magnesium are leafy greens. Anything that is green and pointed at the sun has magnesium because chlorophyll, which is required for photosynthesis, ha ha has to have magnesium in the center of the molecule. So if you eat, but if you eat head lettuce, iceberg lettuce, that's like barely green, almost no magnesium. If you eat dark green lettuce or kale or endive or collards or um, any of the uh, Asian broccoli, and even green broccoli itself, has magnesium in it. Um, uh, uncooked, it's l more difficult for the body to absorb it. The, more it's the better it's cooked, the, the more absorbable it is. Um, whole grains contain magnesium, <laughs> but they're off the list. When you refine whole grains, by rice you, you grind off the brown. All, all rice, when it comes from the field, is brown. To make it white, you have to grind off the bran layer. With that, you remove 90% of the magnesium. Wheat, if you crack it and take out the, remove the, the germ and you remove the bran layer on the outside, 90% of the magnesium is gone. So refining carbs is what has led many of us to be magnesium depleted. And it's needed not just for muscle, but also for bone. And so it takes a fair amount of it once you're depleted to get, it, get enough back in. The other place, because it's in bone, if you take, say you have, um, uh, 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 meat with a bone in, and once you've eaten the meat and, and there's you know, just some stuff left over, nobody wants to eat, put that in a pot and boil it for six or eight hours, a fair bit of the magnesium that's in the bone comes into the broth. You get, you know, for beef, that's a little slow, a slower process. For, chi for poultry, like chicken, you know, if you have a roast chicken and when you've finished eating the roast, you take the carcass, put it in a pot, and for every Kilogram, got to get this right. For every kilogram of um, uh, carcass you put in the pot, you put in two liters of water. Simmer it for four to six hours. You can put in a little onion, a little sour leaves, a little cracked pepper, whatever you want. And when you're done, pour out the, the uh, solids and keep the broth. And then we want you to put enough sodium in it. And I don't know the conversion off the top of my head standing in front of you, but enough sodium in there that you get a, a gram of sodium per cup of the broth, per 250 cc's, so it would be four grams per liter, I guess. Um, and I make that broth, if, if I make two liters of it, I'll put it in either pint or, or half pint containers. The ones I'm going to use in the next day or two go in the fridge, the rest goes in the freezer. And with that broth, you get a pro some protein, and, but also a fair bit of, of magnesium and calcium that comes out of the bones. So there are people in the paleo community who talk about bone broth, but they don't tell you why bone broth is good. I'm telling you why it's good, because you get stuff that's good for your bones out of that uh, by, by making broth and simmering it. Yeah. Here first, and then we'll go back to her. So, so to sort of follow up to that comment as well, that in the first part of your presentation, you spoke about the historical people, I'll just use that term. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were vegetables. So what's your comment about the need to eat vegetables? So my, the question was, the uh, Aboriginal peoples, some of them like the Maasai and the, uh, um, the, Inuit. The, the Inuit, well, yeah, the Inuit and, and the um, uh, Kiowa and Osage peoples didn't eat vegetables. The Inuit, for instance, we know, ate their food either raw or they boiled it. Now that's fascinating. If you're in an igloo, which is made out of snow, in the middle of the Arctic, and you're a Stone Age people, how do you boil food? Hmm? Fat. Boil fat food? No, well, you cook with the fat, but what, what do you cook in? They didn't have metal. I mean, some of them had copper that they'd pick out of the river bottoms in, in some places. But it turns out, I don't know if you've ever seen, Inuit are famous for their stone carving. And they make carved, you know, women with a, a uh, hood on, on their parka with the baby in the hood kind of thing, and they have whales and seals and stuff. And, you know, they make money by carving these really elegant things out of soapstone. Well, soapstone is a stone that doesn't, isn't uh, uh, damaged by fire. And back in, you know, 200 years ago, they weren't carrying around these soapstone figurines with them on, their, on the back when they're, you know, these are nomadic people. They carved pots out of soapstone. And they carved oil lamps out of soapstone. And they would hang these pots over the oil lamps and they'd use seal blubber for fuel. And they boiled their, their food. 
By the way, inside in, in, in the Inuit igloo, when it was uh, minus 30 Celsius or minus, minus 40 Celsius outside, inside the igloo, it was shirt sleeve temperature for them because snow was a very good insulator. And so they cooked it, cooked it and they eat boiled food. And when you boil the food, including the bones, you get a lot of the, the minerals out. Um, so we but they, did, they didn't eat vegetables, and somehow they managed to get by. But we don't know how they did. And the other thing they did, the Inuit loved to crack the, when they, because they lived on seal when they were out on the ice in the winter. In the, when the ice broke up in the, their, their summer, which was like two and a half months, and they went ashore, they lived on caribou, predominantly. And they loved to crack the long bones, a little, the, the, the leg bones of the caribou, and eat the marrow. But when they ate the marrow, there's, when the marrow, there's some places where there's no bone inside. And there are other places where you get these little lacework of bone. It's called trabe trabecular bone inside the, the marrow cavity. And they would, that, that would be broken out. And they were eating, crunching this little bit of, of trabecular bone. And that's how they got calcium. And that's how they got magnesium. So they had, I mean, they didn't have to be chemists a you know, uh, uh, hundred generations of grandmothers sequentially figure out what works. And they lived the same lifestyle in the same place with the same sources of food. I don't, I don't eat anything like what, my, like what my grandparents ate. And the stuff that's in the, I mean, we've changed the, the food that's available to us and our food practices and our pr food processing so much in just in the last 50 years that we're completely adrift as a culture. If you think about these people, they lived in the, in the same territory and followed the same practices for thousands of years. And they had it pretty well dialed in. And then we came trips along and said, we know better. <laughs> and we're finding out that to some degree, there were some learnings that we could would get from them. You know, do we want to practice polygamy like they did? No, I don't think so. <coughs> oh. um, you know, there are a lot of things. Do we want to have half our children die before the age of five? No. Uh, but you know, we don't have to you know, say revere that everything they did was right, but there are some key learnings there that we'd be, we'd be foolish not to at least consider. Yeah? So you're saying vegetables are not essential? Hmm? The question was about vegetables. So I'm saying that they are not essential? If we, if, if we live just like they did, if we live just like they did, we could live without vegetables. But there's not enough marrow to go around. Uh, you know, we don't eat the rib. We don't boil the seal ribs and then chew the rib from starting from the cartilage. You know, the part next, next to the breastbone is very soft. And as you go back towards the backbone, it gets crunchier and crunchier. And they would just chew back till they couldn't break it and chew it anymore. Um, you know, we're we're not going to do that. I guess we could as individuals, but as a society, it's just easier to grow kale, collards, spinach, endive. Um, you know, a variety of vegetables and include those in the diet. But, you know, we're a little bit groping in the dark and it appears that we can explain why vegetables are, are healthful when we're eating, you know, basically for most of us eating market, uh, you know, mass-produced market-grown uh, foods. Uh, the person here in the stripes. Uh, with reference to supplements, what form of magnesium would you recommend? I know you said we can't get your one, but you know, in lieu of that? Um, my recommendation is if you can get a combination of calcium and magnesium together, where it's about equal amounts of calcium and magnesium, but I don't know your brands here. I haven't gone into your, look at your supplement shelves. And maybe we should work on a, Rod, we should work on something on low carb down under. Maybe I, we can, you and I can do some shopping yeah. in the next day or two and put, a, and put together a post. So it's um, Mag 64 is the one that you There's the preparation that I've come to, to from the, found the, the best, it, it was a proprietary mix of um, calcium chloride and magnesium chloride. Now, why include calcium? Because if you take just magnesium, you, I'm sure you can get something here that's a, a magnesium oxide. In the States, it's called milk of magnesia. That's a laxative. Because when you put a big lump of magnesium in your, in your digestive system, your body says, oh, not good. It goes through. It's a laxative. If you 
combine it with calcium, calcium tends to con cause constipation, decreased gut motility, magnesium increases it. You put the two together and you get a neutral mixture. And then this is in a slow release uh, matrix. And so uh, three pills of three, they're be small pills, three per day is enough to, for most people within 20 days to resolve muscle cramps. You, some people told me they can go on, on the web and buy it and get it shipped in. Um, uh, but um, it'd be easier if you could just get it here and not have to pay the extra postage and all that stuff. Uh, but the, the, the original preparation was called SLOMAG, this S-L-O-W-M-A-G. There are two generic versions that always cost less. One of them is called MAG-64. It's just M-A-G-64. And, and the, the other uh, generic version is called MAG, M-A-G, dash delay, as in delayed release. So if you can get that in three pills per day, take it for 20 days. If, the, if your muscle cramps or the muscle cramps of someone you care for uh, are due to mag magnesium depletion, then it'll, it'll, they'll resolve within 20 days. And then the other thing I need to say as a physician, do not take that if you have significant kidney function impairment. So if you have uh, lost more than half of your kidney function, you don't want to take the extra magnesium because you may not excrete it adequately. Yeah. Um. Okay, so what about vitamin C? What did they do with that? Was it like through organ meats? For vitamin C? Yeah. Well, um, if you eat um, uh, even a small amount of lemon juice, which you're allowed to have, yeah. you'll get plenty of vitamin C. If you eat um, two ounces of strawberries, you'll get more vitamin C than you need. So if, within my 50 gram um, uh, carb limit. I include four ounces per day of strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, uh, tomato, uh, total, not four ounces of each. Um, so in, if you're having be fresh berry fruit, uh, including potentially tomato, you'll get enough. You can, if you have a, a couple tablespoons of lemon juice, and it's, it's got some sugar in it, but a couple tablespoons is, is about three or four grams total of carb. I use that lemon juice in making uh, 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 dressings. So you can do a lemon and oil kind of dressing, or I put it in some of my other dressings. Then you'll get plenty. And remember, Stefanson lived for a whole year on just meat and fat, and he didn't get scurvy. And you know, no one, and people have questioned you know, my, when I went to graduate school in nutrition, people you know, said that couldn't be true. So they just discounted it. But it turns out, and this gets into something really esoteric we probably don't want to get into, but it turns out that, that when you, you get ketones in that one to three millimolar range, they turn on internal um, defenses against oxidative stress, what people, some people call free radicals, in a, to, to a very major degree that are latent in the human body. As long as you eat carbs, you're in the garbage zone. Those defenses are turned off. If those defenses are turned off, you've got to have lots of vitamin E, vitamin C, you know, uh, 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 selenium and zinc, and all those things that you need to, to get some antioxidant defenses. But it appears from, this has just come out in the last two years, since we wrote the books, which is why I mentioned before most people came in, we're going to be writing, rewriting these. I'm sorry if you bought them because it's going to be a year and a half or two years, but we're, we're going to have to revise the books because we now know that when you get into nutritional ketosis range, your internal defenses against oxidative stress are turned on. And it may be that vitamin C is only required for humans. I mean, why is it that only humans, your dog, your cat, the birds that fly around outside, the, the, rice, the, the mice and rats that scurry around that you hate, all of them make their own vitamin C. Why is it that we humans don't make vitamin C? And maybe we don't need it because our, until we had agriculture, our ancestors were hunters and we had this internal defense. Uh, and that's how Stefanson survived and said, nya, 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 to, to Walter McClellan and Eugene, Eugene Dubois, who figured he was going to get sick and were disappointed when he didn't get sick. Um, so um, hedge your bets. I mean, if you're, really, if you're worried, buy a seven cents per day you know, generic multivitamin with trace minerals. And if you take it, it won't hurt you. You probably won't, won't you probably don't need it if you get this right. But anyway, we're very eager people right here to say. Yeah, is that, are you talking about 
Um, part of the, what I'm talking about, and you don't want to know this, are a class of, of uh, uh, enzymes called histone deacetylase inhibitors, which turn on, which, which actually are gene silencing enzymes. And this gets really strange. They turn off genes that impair your oxidative stress defense. So it's a negative becomes a positive. In the process, they enhance glutathione production inside mitochondria. Um, which is where mo much of our, uh, our, our reactive oxygen species are produced. Which is far more powerful than vitamin C than antioxidant. Hmm? Which is far more powerful than vitamin C than antioxidant. That's correct. In fact, one of the things that we, if you, I mean, we're still trying to figure out what vitamin C really does, and we think it helps regenerate uh, glutathione. Take it, take it from oxidized to reduced. Uh, right here. And then, then back there. Can you talk about carbs are easy to get? That's easy to get, but a lot of people can't get their protein right. You talk about 1.5 times ideal body weight being the amount of protein you should have a day. Mm -hmm. um, cooked, rolled, can you go over, can you go under, by how much? So, a very simple question. How do you get the right amount of protein? It's a tough answer. Because um, we say, you know, 10 to 15 percent of your daily energy requirement, and, you know, that and 40 cents will buy you nothing. Um, there's a chapter, uh, <laughs> the reason we wrote a book is it doesn't it lend itself to simple sound bites. But for the, when we say one and a half grams per kilo, we don't mean your total body weight, we mean the, what we call, we call reference body weight. There, for you know, the last half century, doctors have talked about ideal body weight and say, well, if you're this tall, your ideal body weight is that. That's hogwash, because we're highly variable one person from another. But we dose protein based on how much lean tissue a person typically would have. And the lean tissue is pretty well um, uh, uh, standardized against a person's stature. With some variations, you know, bodybuilders and people who are really buff are going to have a lot more. But so if, if I'm five foot nine and my reference weight is 70 to 75, so let's say 70 kilograms, 1.5 times that is about a little over 100 grams of protein. And I eat between 100 and 120 a day. Raw or cooked? That, that's, that's cooked protein. Well, no, that's protein. But then the question is that there's not 120 grams of meat, that's 120 grams of protein. So, so, that, that, so we've, we've tried to find a reasonably straightforward way to, to track that. So an ounce of meat, fish, or poultry, which is cooked, will usually have about seven grams of protein. One whole egg will have seven grams of protein. A cup of homemade broth, if you follow our recipe, has about seven grams of protein, by the way. So you can, and by the way, a, an ounce of cheese has seven grams of protein. An ounce of the nuts, not peanuts, but real nuts, uh, with a, a few exceptions, an ounce of nuts has about seven grams of protein. So we can say seven, it's kind of a lucky number when you get to protein, and so, I eat 14, minimum 14 ounces per day. That's my kind of portion. It's not that I have 14 ounces of chicken or 14 ounces of steak. I just total up 14 of those seven gram units per day. So if I, if I have four ounces of chicken on a salad for lunch, and I have eight ounces of, of um, uh, uh, beef for dinner, and I have um, two eggs for breakfast, I've covered my 14 ounces. 14 ounces is how many grams? <coughs> okay. So, 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 no, see, 14, you know, we're, we're, and again, we, I've been told that we, we, need to, we need to translate our book into the, something that's useful for everybody else in the world. And I understand that. <laughs> but, my, but my primary market is, is, is the States. So uh, an ounce of meat is about, you know, an ounce by weight is, is roughly 30 grams. 28, 28 point something. But 0.4, yeah. But I'm trying to be in... I'm, I'm, I'm not painting in detail, so I'm broad strokes. So 30, 30 grams of, of meat, fish, or poultry, when it's cooked, contains about 7 grams of protein. So it would be 30 gram units then, rather than ounces, sorry. So, you know, um, one way to do this is once you've figured out you're going to try this, sit down with a, a dietitian, but one who accepts the fact that this might not kill you. 
and have that person work with you for an hour or half an hour, you know, and then come back a week later or two weeks later and then go over what you've done and refine it. Um, it uh, it's not once you, once, but, and you don't have to weigh everything for the rest of your life because once you figure out what it looks like, it becomes second nature within a, a, you know, a few weeks or even a, or just a month. Yeah. Um, Stephen, thanks very much. I've got a question around sports performance. So um, I, love, I run marathons, I love carbs. Know all about how many grams of carbohydrates I have to have, how many hours beforehand so I don't hit the ball, blah, blah. My coach has told me to come and listen to this tonight. Okay. Um, we have a garden, we grow all our own vegetables, raspberries, carrots, everything, no chemicals, all organically, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really well. I only want to drop two kilos, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want to drop my carbs. So for a, and I run marathons all the time, so for a sports person who's not got diabetes, got great cholesterol and all of that's fine and they're not overweight but just want to trim down a bit, is going to a paleo routine a good first step to see if that works before thinking about going to like the extreme of, yeah, a radical, of ketosis. Because like two kilos isn't much, but I want to just maintain that, but still have enough carbs so I can run a marathon and get wider and faster. Hey Rod, can I load that slide, slide set and spend the? I'm uh, talking to Rod. No, I'm just I'm just joking. So when I saw We're tom tom slide, I tomorrow I night, tomorrow night we're doing a a, a thing on sports nutrition. Yes, but okay, no, it's, it's okay. You came to the right place. But, um, I was taught that you needed carbs for any kind of endurance sport that went beyond about half an hour. Yeah. So if you know, if my kids played soccer and there was the football, you call it European football. You know, more than 45 minutes, we had to dose them with lots of sports drinks and, and fruit and stuff, um, uh, and. That's what I set out to. I set out to prove that that was right, and that's what led me to low carb. Because what we found is that if we adapt people to low carb for three months or three weeks or longer, you know, our first study was on untrained, overweight people, but our second study was on on uh, highly trained bike racers, and we could actually get them. Once they get through that sag, they were their their, their endurance performance, not sprint performance. After after four weeks, their endurance performance was unimpaired. But they were functioning not on 50% carbs and 50% fat, but they were functioning on 90% fat. So that was one of the things that led Jeff Volek to me, and he you know, picked me up and dusted me off and said, let's you know, get back in the game, guy. Is that what this one That's, is? That's what that one is. Um, and so Jeff, Jeff has recently done a study. I only did five subjects. He, he recruited 10 ultra runners who use a high carb fueling strategy who take three gels every hour, and these guys will run for either, and women will run for 50 to 100 miles continuously. Um, and they'll take three, at least three gels per hour. So they're getting 50% of the calories as they go. Because if you run beyond a marathon, if you aren't adding carbs, you're going to run out of carbs, you're going to hit the wall. The low carb runners have, and, and we've had, there's been a resurgence of interest in this in the last five years. The low carb runners, um, train low, that is they do their training on very low carb, and some of them uh, preload with uh, a sweet potato, just a, or half a sweet potato the night before, nothing refined, nothing sugar, and then they'll take one gel, 100 calories every hour. And so they're functioning on one third the carb level. And one of the problems that ultra runners have is when they get past 30 or 40 miles, they, the, the, all that carb going in with for doing a high carb regimen causes nausea and vomiting and diarrhea, which really messes up your race. <laughs> they stop and they keep running, by the way. I mean, I mean any, anybody who would run 100 miles to begin with has got to, but anyway. They're some truly remarkable people. When you take away the carbs in training and give them back li very little carbs, um, not only are people now finishing events and, and not having problems with the GI nausea, vomiting, et cetera, that people are, are now, the ultra runners are doing this low carb strategy, are winning events and setting new course records. Um, so there's a guy, we, our local race in California is a 100 mile race that starts at Lake Tahoe up in the mountains, runs up over the mountain ridge and then down the far side, 100 miles on mountain trails, not on roads. 
And th uh, three years ago, a guy from Oregon who had had major problems for the previous two years on high carb with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, he said the year before he, he went low carb, he said, I could have won the race if, except for the 14 times I had to stop and go in the bushes. Then <laughs> you know, it really troubled him. So he, he dropped his carbs because we were all told we have to eat carbs. And this guy had the, the, you know, he had the motivation to cut out his carbs, train on no carbs, and eat very low carb during. And now we did, he won the race. He cut 21 minutes off the all-time record. Um, and so he finished, he ran 100 miles over the mountains on mountain trails in 14 hours and 46 minutes. And everybody said, yeah, Tim, Tim, he did it, but you know, that was a fluke. <laughs> Next year he came back, the second hottest year on record, and he won it again. Uh, and people are, the, the, the US record for 100 miles on a track was run by Zach Bitter on low carb. And then Zach kept running for the next 15 minutes and set the world record for the, the most miles run in, in 12 hours. Um, so it's possible to do this, but it, it's radical. So Jeff did this study where he recruited uh, 10 high carb runners, 10 low carb runners, brought them in and studied them, and demonstrated that when you keto adapt as a low carb runner, you double the rate at which you can burn body fat. That gives you permission to lose that two kilos you want to lose. So is that what that book's about? That's what that book is about. OK, and he's going to paleo the first step instead of going straight to radical? Um, we, we wrote this one in 2011. We wrote this for doctors. But because doctors have no training in, most of us have no training in, in medical school, an educated lay reader can read most of this and understand it pretty well. And so we, and we self-published this because no publisher would let us write something like, on the back we said, uh, if you want clear, unabridged, and hard-hitting nutrition science, buy this book. If you want the mainstream consensus view, put it down and tiptoe gently away. <laughs> so we, we couldn't write that. In the, in the, so we, we've self-published it. And then people read it. And then they said, well, our athlete people, because this was start coming to getting athletes, so they came and said, what about us? So we wrote this. So if you really have to think of this as, you know, this is the introduction, and this is the addendum for athletes. I'm not trying to sell two books, but we had people buy this one and say, well, wait a minute. This isn't complete. Where's all the other stuff? Well, it's in the previous third. And are those papers and those reports by that guy that did the study on ultramarathoners, is that on, online? Is that available to read or learn about as you know, evidence, or is it something that's hidden away? Or? Uh, we quote a lot of the stuff in here, but the thing, the, 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 we published this in 2012 in April. Tim Olson won the Western states in June of that year, and then won the next one the year after. So again, this knowledge is accelerating. We're just trying to keep up, because we're being driven by people who are finding that the, 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 the kind of trite term we use is there's considerable consumer perceived benefit for athletes uh, in, the, in the ultra endurance area, uh, or even the endurance area with this. And yeah. Did you check out the local uh, website and, and go to the videos? There's one of the sessions from the recent conferences has that, that particular story, I think, and talks more about. Yeah, there are two, vid there are two videos by Jeff Volek, V O L E K, my co author on this. There's one by Tim Noakes at Low Carb Down Under from back in, uh, was that September 2nd or something? So there's a Tim Noakes, <coughs> N O A K E S, video on, uh, and with which. He very graciously discussed our research as well as his own. Steve, give him serial killers for goodness sakes. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> well, serial, serial killers is... ...until first after the break. I think we should all stand up and have a stretch and a break and maybe get a drink. Maybe a 10 minute sort of spell um, and then we'll, we'll get back into it. Thank you.